Yellow fever is an infectious disease caused by mosquito bites. In the most severe cases, the skin and eyes develop jaundice, becoming yellow. According to the CDC, about 30,000 people die from the disease each year, 90% in Africa. Infants and the elderly are most at risk. So the impact of this disease is more heavily felt by women, who are most often the ones burdened with caring for family members who fall ill. Yellow fever is a very personal issue for me. My maternal grandmother died from the disease. She lived in the state of Kerala in southern India in the 1950s. While there's no cure for yellow fever, there is a strong vaccine. But back in the 1950s, the yellow fever vaccine was not available to my grandmother. If she'd been able to get it, it most certainly would have saved her life. Now, there are global efforts to make this vaccine widely available, especially in parts of Africa where it was unaffordable. The World Health Organization, or WHO, is partnering with UNICEF, the vaccine alliance Gavi, and more than 50 healthcare providers to make the vaccine widely available throughout the continent. It could be a game changer. That's a hope, at least. Though frustratingly, in some places, there are efforts to undermine the vaccine campaign. On today's episode of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, a production of foreign policy, we're going to Uganda, one of the 27 high-risk countries in Africa that's working with the World Health Organization and others to try to end yellow fever epidemics by 2026. To that end, the Uganda Ministry of Health has been distributing the yellow fever vaccine to millions of people. At least 13.4 million doses of vaccines are now available for 51 high-risk districts prioritized in the first phase. Later in the show, we'll hear from WHO experts about what they think is needed to end yellow fever epidemics. But first, we turn to reporter Lea Kahunde. She spoke with a journalist whose investigative reporting forced officials to confront flaws in their vaccine procedures. Beatrice Nyangoma's path into journalism was marked by personal challenges. Raised by a single mother after losing her father at a young age, she understood the hardships of obtaining basic health care. My only brother passed on because of cancer, but none of the health facilities could diagnose the exact issue that my brother was suffering from. So I grew up seeing very many people struggling to get basic health care. Yes, the government health facilities were there, but always most people would return home without medicines as they would be referred to private uh, health facilities to buy the prescriptions. As a young girl, Beatrice had always dreamt of becoming a journalist. And when she got older, she realized she could use it to tell the stories of her country's health system that had impacted her and so many others. I realized that writing about issues in the health sector that are affecting communities drew some attention from policymakers, but also from non-governmental organizations. I would see changes happen here and there every time I would write a story that's about a health facility. Some intervention, maybe not that much, but some interventions would later come. By 2016, Beatrice had reason to become a health journalist and a bureau chief at Uganda Radio Network. She was assigned to report on a yellow fever outbreak in Masaka, a district in central Uganda. East African countries were reporting cases of yellow fever and traveling was becoming restricted. And particularly in Uganda, I think Masaka was affected a lot and there was a lot of tension. To combat this, the government pushed for increased vaccinations. So one of the interventions that was being promoted by the health ministry was to see that every traveler is vaccinated and then gets a yellow fever vaccination card. Then, Beatrice had an interesting opportunity. A delegation of Ugandan politicians was about to visit Tanzania, and Beatrice was invited to travel with them to cover the event. But then, something piqued her curiosity. The delegation needed yellow fever vaccination cards within just three days to travel to Tanzania, way less time than was needed. But for me, my mind quickly ran to how are they accessing yellow fever vaccination card? Because the invitation was on short notice. At that time, one would have to move to Kampala to get vaccinated and get that card. So ideally, someone would need like two days 
to go come you know so at KCCA clinic the line the queues are always very long and sometimes they would run out of uh, the vaccine so it was also not an obvious thing that you would go then get vaccinated then get get your card to understand the situation better Beatrice decided to try it herself what she discovered was alarming. Government health facilities were also issuing fake vaccination cards. So what I did, I went to the municipality and requested them that I needed to be vaccinated. The gentleman I found there asked me, do you want a card or do you want to be vaccinated? Stunned by this brazen disregard for health safety, Beatrice set out to see how widespread the vaccination card fraud was. So she began talking to other travellers on her trip. I asked one of the people who were supposed to be part of that team whether they had been vaccinated. And he told me they had been issued cards. So I asked him, how do you get a card without being vaccinated? What card? The yellow fever vaccination card. So he was like, ah, oh, it's very simple. We just gave in our details, our names, and they processed the cards for us. So I was like, okay, I had, I had not gone to the district health office before. So I reached at the counter and told the gentleman I want to be vaccinated. So the gentleman was like, do you want to be vaccinated or do you want a card? So for me, I was like, what is the difference? I need to be vaccinated. So I was like, if you want to be vaccinated, you need 150,000, then I will tell you where you can get vaccinated from. But if you want a card, you pay 20,000, leave your details there, leave your phone number, I will call you at around four. So just to be clear, it was more than seven times cheaper to get a fake card than the actual vaccination. This was midday. By 4 p.m., she got her fake card. She soon realized this corruption of issuing fake vaccination cards was deeply rooted in Uganda. Around the same time, Beatrice happened to be invited to a conference in Rwanda where she saw an opportunity to expose this issue to a high-ranking Ugandan official. There was a health conference where East African ministers, and it so happened that our Minister of Health, uh, Dr. General Thacheng, was going to be one of the presenters. So for me, I used that opportunity. Vaccination cards are required to enter and exit many African countries, including Uganda. Beatrice told the health minister how easy it was to use a fake card to get past airport security. So I went to the airport and I intentionally carried the card that I bought at 20,000 from the municipality. So, you know, as you're checking in at the airport, you have to carry all your paperwork and the card. So I also intentionally made sure that I stand in front of someone who has a genuine card because I, I knew the KCCA cards that were being issued. They had a seal. So I go to check in. The lady checks me. I show her my card. I am allowed to enter. Now it was time for the man with the real card to come through and to her surprise, he was stopped. The gentleman who was behind me, who had a, a genuine card, and I assume he had been vaccinated, was told to wait that his card was fake. But me who had a fake card, I had passed. So I went all through and went for the conference. And for me, I saw an opportunity that I'm going to meet the minister. The story shocked the Ugandan health minister, but it really hit home when she showed her the fake yellow fever vaccination card. And so she was like, hey, Beatrice, I didn't know this. We've been hearing about the, uh, those rumors, but we did not have evidence. So she took a picture of my card, my fake card. Right after the conference, Beatrice ran the story about the fake vaccination card scheme on Uganda Radio Network. So the story aired. Of course, I got a lot of backlash. Everyone was looking for Beatrice, Beatrice. The politicians were looking for me. They were furious over her expose and she faced repercussions. So one was um, being blacklisted from events at the municipality by those particular leaders. Sometimes I would write a story and probably I need um, a comment from any of them. They would uh, ban me from, you know, they would not sp speak to me. 
While certain politicians give a hard time for the story, Uganda's health minister, Dr. Jen Ruth Chang, was genuinely concerned and real change was put into motion. So after five days, and I remember her picking her, her phone to call me, to tell me, Beatrice, I have an exclusive for you and it is only meant for you. I'm like, hey, I'm listening, minister. So she gave me an interview and I did the story. The health ministry decided to tighten the rules for who could administer the yellow fever vaccine to 11 accredited health facilities. These would be the only places where you could get a card. And for me, that was a win on my, on my side. You know, as journalists, the moment you write about something and action is made, there is nothing more satisfying as that even if you don't have money, even if you don't have what. Beatrice's expose sent a strong message to politicians and policymakers. It prompted action from the health minister. Accountability and more policy changes followed. So after accreditation of uh, the 11 health facilities, also Minister of Health recalled all those earlier issued yellow fever vaccination cards. If one really got their card from KCCA, they would go and then renew the card. But if the card wasn't issued by KCCA. One had to go and get vaccinated and get a card from those 11 operated health facilities. Beatrice Nyangoma's journey began with a simple desire to tell the stories of everyday people, but it evolved into a resolute mission to ensure accountability in healthcare. Through her investigative journalism, she saved countless Ugandan lives, ensuring access to genuine yellow fever vaccination and essential health care. Beatrice's work stands as a testament to journalism's power to hold those in power accountable. For me, choosing to be in the health journalism sector, it was intentional. I wanted to see changes, and that was one of the major changes that I have seen through using my pen. For the hidden economics of remarkable women, I am Lea Kahunde. Up next, what will it take for the Ugandan government to meet its pledge to end yellow fever epidemics by 2026? WHO experts share their thoughts after the break. Welcome back to the Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women from Foreign Policy. I'm Rena Ninen. Before the break, you heard about how one journalist managed to hold the government accountable and end a fraud scheme of illegitimate vaccine cards. This reporting helped ensure that the yellow fever vaccination process was credible, a crucial step in helping the country reduce incidents of yellow fever. As we were mentioning at the top of the show, there's a big push from the WHO and others to try to end yellow fever epidemics by 2026, including in Uganda. I had the privilege to talk to two WHO experts about this. Dr. Pamela Bakabulindi, an immunization consultant with the World Health Organization in Uganda, and Dr. Kwame Amponsa Achiano, a deputy director for disease control and program manager for the expanded program on immunization at the Ghana Health Service. Dr. Pamela, first off, how is Uganda making strides towards reducing yellow fever? So Uganda is one of the 27 high-risk countries in Africa. The country has, number one, introduced yellow fever into its routine immunization in 2022. And last year, in 2023, it began um, doing uh, what they call preventive mass vaccination. And in 2023, it did its first uh, phase where over 9 million People were covered. This year in 2024, they are planning their second and third preventive mass vaccine campaign. And we believe that after the third phase, the whole of Uganda will be protected against the yellow fever disease. So ending yellow fever epidemics is very crucial as a global health strategy and also as a national strategy. There's a strategy called the Eliminate Yellow Fever Epidemics, also known as I, which is a global comprehensive and long-term strategy that has been running from 2017, and it's aiming at uh, ending yellow fever epidemics by 2026. And it has three objectives. The first is to protect at-risk populations. The second is to prevent international spread. 
and the third is to contain outbreaks rapidly. Now let's turn to Dr. Kwame. You helped the country to end various epidemics, including yellow fever. Why do you think Ghana has seen success in recent years in its effort to reduce yellow fever? Thank you very much. Yes, Ghana has seen some success, basically because of careful planning. We have data since 1950. We used to have explosive outbreaks many years ago. Control in the first instance was not very well coordinated. But over the past several years, we've seen some serious control efforts, very well coordinated. We normally have had several outbreaks, but recently the outbreaks have not been that explosive. Why do you think the outbreaks haven't been that explosive? What do you attribute that success to? Over the past several years, we introduced yellow fever into the routine immunization in 1992. Over time, we've seen some improvement in coverage, and we are doing above 95%, just like any other vaccine. Um, added to that, we've also done some preventive mass vaccination campaigns. We've also been doing outbreak response strategies, and lately we do rapid outbreak response This episode is deeply personal to me. My maternal grandmother died in the 1950s in India from yellow fever, and we've learned so much more. Dr. Kwame, you know, my grandmother lived in a remote area of India. How are you serving people in remote areas to get them vaccinated? Yeah, so in Ghana, immunization is actually very well integrated into the primary health care system. And so for us, us in Ghana, We work with the communities. So the community is a center. And that is how we're able to get to the very remote areas. We move into the communities to render service. And then for very hard to reach areas, we go over, for example, the islands. We go there and sleep over for about three, four days up to a week on a regular basis to get not just vaccination, but other child health interventions and maternal health interventions done before we come up. So a recent outbreak, for example, occurred in very remote and scattered communities in the Savannah region of Ghana. Since the outbreak was in cattle rarities or herdsmen, we needed to get them. Uh, Usually they are very elusive because of uh, mistrust. And so we had to go through the, the butchers. Obviously, the butchers would be their friends. Dr. Kwame, I absolutely love this story because... You said that you found who their friends were, who their allies, and this nomadic community just didn't trust people. And the one community of people they trusted were the butchers who they relied on. And how did you figure out this could be your point of entry for immunization? Yeah, so we did a quick appraisal. Now we have a very strong communication and social mobilization network. And that is how come we're able to work with the butchers. Because we knew that once they were cattle rearers, then obviously the butchers will be their friends because they are the ones who buy the cattle. Great story. Pamela, you have also used mobile units in vaccination campaigns. How have they worked and been supportive in your efforts? So in most cases, the mobile teams are used in hard to reach areas, such as the islands, the mountainous areas, or the forest areas, or any geographically hard to reach areas. So you'll find that in an island, there are no health facilities. And it's only a mobile team that can work. In certain geographical hard to reach areas, only a mobile team can work because there are no health facilities. So they really come in handy. Dr. Miller, what are some of the issues and the difficulties you have with gathering data from your population sample? Right now, the World Health Organization is trying to you know, make sure that we get gender-related data, but that has not been a realization. When we get the data, it's not gender disaggregated. But all measures are being put towards gender disaggregated data. But also, when we're going to do reports or you know, do any analysis, we depend on coverage survey data, for example, data from demographic surveys or cluster surveys, to give us an estimate of the population that has been vaccinated or not vaccinated. Both of you have made very clear the importance of working locally with the right collaborators and partners that have trust of the community, despite what group you might be working with. I'm wondering with you, both of you, do either of you have a favorite memory you want to share about working with local collaborators to find a solution to vaccine access or support? Yes. So we have vaccine-hesitant communities within Uganda. 
And during the campaigns, these communities tend to hide or shut their doors. But during the campaigns, we work with the local councils, with the resident district commissioners. We work with the local district authorities. We work with the police force. We work with the army. We work with the president's force <laughs> to make sure that these hesitant communities are a sort of, um, they are held responsible or they are encouraged to accept the immunization. And Dr. Kwame, do you have a favorite memory? Yes. One of the most important local, I don't know whether it fits into a local uh, structure, is this, the schools. In fact, I would say that they are our most important allies uh, because mostly our campaigns and even routine immunization ends when the child is about five years. And so working with the schools uh, has been one of the most important and memorable issues for us in Ghana. Dr. Pamela and Dr. Kwame, I want to thank you so much for your time and your efforts and for explaining to us yellow fever and the successes and the struggles of getting the region immunized. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having us. Next week, we head to Kenya. In 2021, their president pledged to end gender-based violence by 2026. Kenya commits itself to fully enforce gender-based violence laws and policies by adopting a gender-based violence indicator in the government performance contract. Now, with two years left on the pledge, we can check in on the progress that's been made, what's left to do, and those who are holding the government accountable. That's next week on the podcast. And that does it for today's show. The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women is a production of Foreign Policy and is made possible through funding in part from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women is hosted by me, Rena Ninen. Laura Rosbrow Tellum is our senior producer. Rob Sachs, our managing director. Production assistance provided by David Munoz and Nicholas Petri Mitchell. And Leah Kahunde contributed reporting for this episode. And if you like our show, we hope you'll share the love. If you're on social media, do post about it. And if not, tell a friend how much you appreciate the show. Thanks again. We'll be back in your feed next week.